So while I was away, uh, last Sunday, uh, we had Adam Curtis uh, deliver the sermon for us. And uh, Adam, I've heard from a number of people. Uh, many people were really looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, everybody said that you did a fantastic job, so uh, thank you for doing that and, and sharing your heart with our, with our congregation. Uh, the week before, um, we had Paula Moriarty here. Uh, Paula is just a, a bundle of energy and a little dynamo, and I'm never around Paula except to uh, be inspired by her. She's, uh, uh, she just loves the ministry that she does with International Child Care Ministries, and uh, I was pleased that she was able to come and, and be here and, and be with our church on, on that Sunday. But here we are, it's September 8th, and summer is essentially, dare I say it, behind us. You know, we at that point. Nights are pretty consistently getting down into the single digits of temperature. New school year has begun. And I'm certain I saw, as much as I didn't want to see it, I'm certain I have seen leaves change color on the trees. Have you guys seen that? Yes. Well, they're in your yard. <laughs> okay. Well, you keep it to yourself for now. <laughs> we don't want to be reminded. But this week, a new ministry season begins. I call it that because I find that the, the calendar is naturally divided up into blocks of time when regularly scheduled church activities function. There's this block of time from now, September, until uh, the end of November. You have three months in which as a church uh, you can run groups, host events, assemble for worship and care for those aspects of ministry which are known to be healthy habits uh, for the Christian church. And then we hit December and normal routines make way for the anticipation and celebration of Christmas. It's an interference in the church calendar but a happy one, right? A break in the schedule to drink in the profound truth of Jesus' humble incarnation among humanity. The Christmas holiday is extended a little bit on the calendar uh, with the coming of the new year and a second season of ministry in the church year uh, begins sometime early in January. The next major break after that in the calendar is Easter. About another three month stretch from January to Easter for the church to implement its ministries of care and teaching. Now, Easter is typically a shorter break, but then we get into the concluding weeks of our ministry year. By the May long weekend, we find that people are already starting to think about summer and think about weekends away and going to the trailer and going to the cottage and, and all those kinds of things. Summer then allows us to be a little more informal. We run some day programs, we invest in kids' camps, we also have a little bit more time to uh, visit one another in, in kind of a relaxed way. But that's essentially the life in the church over the course of a year. And now, uh, here in September, we enter into a new season of ministry activity. So I hope that you will examine the bulletin and, and join into any and all of the activities uh, that you think you might like to be part of, uh, attending or volunteering, uh, connect in with our church. This is a great church, and you'll be glad that you did connect in with it. Uh, this very day, today, uh, we already mentioned it, but it's the church picnic. Uh, that's a great way to connect and, and reconnect after, after a few weeks of um, being away over the summer. Um, maybe there's people in the church that you haven't seen for, for quite some time. Uh, they were here while you were away, and you were here while they were away. It only takes you being away one Sunday, them being away another Sunday. Suddenly, you haven't seen each other in three weeks. Uh, the church picnic is a good way to, to connect and reconnect and, and uh, hear some stories of what each other has been doing over the summer. As we enter into this new season of ministry together, I put some prayer and thought into our upcoming sermon topics. And so I wanted to start uh, by recentering us. All the priorities of all the routines that flood upon us as we exit summer mode, it's important that we put first things first. 
So that will be this week and, and the next two Sundays. We'll kind of talk about that. I'm going to call a mini-sermon series, The Big Picture. And after that, I'm going to do something I did not plan to do. I will take four weeks on the topic of spiritual warfare. Uh, Many of you will know that we have an awful lot of people in our church going through very hard circumstances. Um, There's people who are suffering through prolonged illness in our church. There's people who have gone through grief and loss. Uh, recent diagnosis of life-changing diseases. I'm, I'm hearing about that from people. Um, one's going through family strife. Some going through job insecurity. Some suffering through depression. Some of these things you know about. Some of them I know about. Some of them uh, aren't told to any of us. And uh, we have people that are kind of suffering silently through different things. But there are enough things happening to enough people in our church that folks are wondering, and they're wondering out loud to me even, are we under spiritual attack? So I thought I would address this together through a four-week sermon series, and I'm going to start that on September 29th. After that, I want to pick back up on the topic of worship that we started to look at back in the spring. Uh, Worship is such a vital and assumed practice of the people of God, and, and it's being influenced by a new level of professional showmanship such that I think we need to think carefully about uh, what does worship, what do we think about worship? What do we understand about worship? How we, um, how we want to practice it and practice it together as a church. And we're going we're gonna to think through those things in November. Then, of course, in December, we will celebrate Advent with a focus on the story of Jesus entering our world in the form of a baby at Christmas time. I have an idea where I'm going to go in that sermon series, too, but not quite uh, certain yet. But with that, we have only 17 Sundays until the new year. And time ticks by pretty quick, doesn't it? So, today we begin with 1 Corinthians chapter 2. If you want to turn in your Bible there, in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, we'll look at that. If you don't have a Bible, that's fine. You can just listen along. Uh, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, here's what it says. And I, when I came to you, brothers, this is the Apostle Paul speaking to the, uh, to the faithful believers in the city of Corinth. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men but in the power of God let's begin with an actual conversation I had with somebody once I'd been a pastor for about seven years at this point and I was talking with a mom and a dad who were very sparse attenders in in that church at that time And I was telling them, I was telling them about our children's program and how they could enroll their daughter and and we would love to have her attend uh, the kids' programming at the church. And the mom, very politely, I believe she was being genuine, uh, but the mom responded, she said, no, we don't think so. We have her already attending a Catholic school, so she already gets enough religion there. It's hard for me to imagine a statement that more thoroughly or completely misses the entire point of the whole of Scripture and the mission of the church. Now this lady, I knew her, she was innocent enough in her statement. No desire to offend or to disparage myself nor the church was anywhere near what she meant. She was not being malicious, but but think about the underlying philosophy uh, that resides in that statement. She believes that religion is one category among many in our lives, and she furthermore believes that Jesus is no more than a singular ingredient 
in that box. And it's like people believe that they are some sort of conductor who has all of these boxes at their disposal to engage with depending on the day and depending on the mood that strikes them just then. And so today they'll, they'll open up the religion box. It's Sunday, so I'm going to do a religion day. And once that is over, the box gets closed up and gets put back on the shelf with all the other optional boxes that are on offer. And tomorrow then, we pick up the work box, the job box, the career box. We, we pick up that box and then we set it down at the end of the day. And on Tuesday, well, on Tuesday, we have to pick up the work box again. So we do that box. But then in the evening, maybe we, we pick up the sports box. And we get to do whatever activity uh, that we kind of enjoy doing. And then we put that box down. And on, on Wednesday, well, Wednesday again, we have to pick up the work box. But maybe Wednesday evening, uh, we come to Circle of Friends or we go to the pastor's Bible study and, and we, we pick up the religion box again on Wednesday evening and put it back down. And on, on Thursday, we have a dentist appointment. So we, we pick up the health box and, and we, we take care of that component and then we put it back down. And on Thursday evening, we pick up the grocery shopping box and, and we take care of that and then we put that down again. And on Friday, well, it's back to the work box again. So we, we pick that one back up. But then in the evening, it's the pick up the uh, hang out with some friends and have fun box. And so we pick that box up. And we put it back down. On, on Saturday, what kind of boxes do we pick up on Saturday? Maybe the work in your garden box. Maybe chores in the morning box. Maybe clean up from all the stuff we didn't do during the week box. Maybe the hang out with people box. Maybe you go to the this place or that place box. Visit some friends box. All these different boxes we might pick up on, on Saturday. Maybe, maybe a relaxation box too. And on Sunday, we pick up the religion box again. And week after week, we are the conductor of many boxes in our lives. And, and who is in control? It's me. I'm in control. I'm, I'm in control. It's a method of operating that, that says, I am the conductor and I will make all the decisions about which boxes to include in my life, which ones to pick up at which different times. Uh, some people love to pick up the gardening box. And they love that box. They can't wait to get their hands on, on the gardening box. And, and other people, <laughs> no thanks. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to touch that box if I don't have to. And other people, they grab a hold of that fishing box. And they, they wrap two arms around that thing and they don't want to let go. And other stuff gets in the way of the fishing box. Then there's others. I don't care about the fishing box. I don't need to do that. And the world offers uh, this sea of options. And some people, they grab hold of that work box, that career box, that, that um, job box, the, the get ahead, the, the invest myself in box. They, they love what comes out of that box. They love that sense of accomplishment. And they pour themselves into that box almost to an unhealthy degree sometimes too, right? And they put all other boxes to the side. But there's all these types of boxes you can pick and choose from because you are the conductor of your life. So you can decide which box, boxes to uh, bring close to you and which boxes to use most often and also which boxes to disregard totally. You don't have to open them all and pick them all up. The choice is fully and entirely up to you. And the wisdom of this world affirms this very picture. It says, yes, you are indeed the conductor and the chief decision maker in your life. And then the world offers to you advice on which boxes to select and which ones to leave alone. And there are books and there are seminars and there are self-help gurus and there are psychologists and psychiatrists and there are counselors and there are competency tests and there are personality tests all to help you discern and decide uh, what's healthy for you in terms of which boxes to pick up and which ones to leave alone. Uh, some of that advice is based on mistakes other people have learned from. Some advice is conventional wisdom. Some advice is common sense. And some advice is hogwash. 
It's not all good advice. But it all agrees with the underlying premise. You are the conductor of your life and therefore you have full autonomy of which boxes you get to pick up and set down and when. But the Apostle Paul argues for something entirely different. He argues that life is not about the control of which boxes you get to pick up and choose from. Rather, life is about relationship and one relationship above all others. And that is your relationship with Jesus Christ. And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech and wisdom. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstrations of the Spirit and of power that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. What does Paul say about the priority and place of Jesus Christ? I have determined to make sure that I pick up the Jesus box at least once a week. Is that what he says there? No. I have determined to pile all my favorite boxes together and then pick up the Jesus box and put it on top and to make sure that he is on top of of the pile all the time. Is that what he says? Is that how he articulates it? I have determined to allow Jesus to be the guy who selects the boxes for me so that I'm always doing the right things. I think this is sometimes what we believe, that we just allow Jesus to be the director in our lives instead of myself. It's like, it's like that old bumper sticker. You ever seen that one, uh, Jesus is my co-pilot? You ever seen that bumper sticker? Jesus is my co-pilot. In other words, I'm, I'm allowing Jesus to speak into my life as, as a chief advisor. Thinking that idea falls too short, there was a competing bumper sticker in response that said, do you remember this one? If Jesus is your co-pilot, then... Do you remember the punchline of that bumper sticker? If Jesus is your co-pilot, then switch seats. Don't let Him only advise your life. Let Him conduct your life. But still, that very advice lives in the same world of playing with the boxes. And Paul said something very different. I have determined to know nothing among you but Christ and Him crucified. The key word here is the knowing piece. The knowledge piece. Because Paul, in fact, knew quite a lot, didn't he? He was a very smart guy and studied far above the normal population. He spoke at least three languages, uh, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. He lived in a world of overlapping cultures. He easily navigated between them. The, the dominance of Rome, the culture of the Greeks, and the environment of first century Palestine. Uh, we in Canada, we believe that we have strength in our diversity. Well, we know nothing of diversity compared to the multi-language and multicultural environment of first century uh, Roman Mediterranean world. That was diversity. And Paul could navigate it quite comfortably. He was a Roman citizen. He knew their laws. He could easily speak to the Greeks about their culture and their gods. He was a master of the Old Testament Scriptures. He was a leader in Hebrew society. When he says, I determined to know nothing but Christ and Him crucified, it's not though, as though he felt an obligation to toss his intellect aside. That's not what he was doing. To know Christ, as Paul is saying, is to do nothing less than treat Him as a person who is a friend right beside you all the time. It's relational knowledge. Not know about Christ, but know Christ. When it comes to relational language, sometimes our theological uh, terminology fails us. And that's when the church falls to its poets. We sometimes press pause on our theological language to allow other appropriate words to wash over us in different ways. And so in a little bit, we're going to do that through communion. We'll allow the liturgy and the prayers to draw us afresh and anew into a proper and whole 
relationship with Jesus Christ, starting off a new ministry season together uh, with this fresh relationship uh, restarted and rekindled before him. But before that, I want to turn to another poet. So look in your hymn book at number 425. When I think about poetic and relational language that describes our relationship with Jesus in a real and living way, <clears throat> this song is the one that comes to mind. Many of you know it. Are, are you all turned to it? In the garden. Let's, let's sing it. Uh, we don't have uh, accompaniment and I'm not much of a song leader, but let's sing. You'll have to sing loud to, to fill in. <laughs> yeah. Let, let's go ahead and say, listen to the words of the song as you sing, okay? I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God discloses and He walks with me and He talks with me and He tells me I am His own and the joy we share as we tarry there None other has ever known. So listen to Paul's words again. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I think this is what he meant. He walks with me and He talks with me. And He tells me I am His own. And the joy we share as we tarry there None other has ever known. He's describing a living, active, real-time, right-now relationship. Jesus Christ is not a theology. Jesus Christ is not a religion. It's not something to adhere to. Uh, he is a person that we are involved with. And this poetry uh, reminds us of that. Let's sing verse 2, and then we're going to turn to our communion liturgy together, okay? Okay. 